The physics of disordered materials is the study of the electronic, the structural, the vibrational, pretty much all the fundamental properties of, of this important class of materials. Disordered materials are, are materials in which the positions of the constituent atoms do not have a perfect order to them. So uh, this refers to uh, any kind of, a, any kind of a, a material where the atoms are not periodically arranged. When atoms are regularly arranged in, a, in a, a, some motif that's repeated, that's what we call a crystal. So this is, this is the case that lacks that kind of, kind of long-range order, as we call it. Crystals have, have a translational periodicity, so there's one little unit that gets copied again and again and again. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's not a small unit, sometimes it's like a protein where it might be hundreds of thousands of atoms for which we saw a Nobel Prize just a couple of years ago. Um, but when you don't have that kind of, that kind of periodicity, that's the domain of the amorphous materials. The physics of disorder is a very broad topic. It's studied by experimentalists in laboratories and by theorists like myself with pencil and paper and with computers. It has many features which are absolutely unique. They're unknown in the physics of crystals. We know there are lots of important things you can do with crystals. I mean, the world's been changed by them. But amorphous materials have other properties which are useful and are not fully understood, and there's a lot of opportunity for, for a deeper understanding. We have a particular emphasis on the electronic properties and the structural properties, more recently, phase change properties, um, and mostly we take a simulation point of view. So that those, those are the elements of the, the physics of disordered materials we're most interested in. Phase change materials uh, are some of the most interesting disordered materials people are looking at these days, partly because they're technologically important. Um, in fact, Samsung is selling a lot of cell phones, which has a, a memory uh, device that's based on these phase change materials. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very complicated material based on germanium, antimony, and tellurium with, in very specific ratios. Uh, and uh, <coughs> These, the, the basic idea of the cell phone memory is that you have two, two phases. You have a crystalline and amorphous phase of these materials, and you can change between them. You can store information because there, there is an electrical conductivity difference between the amorphous and the crystalline phases, so that if you, if you, if you want to store a bit, I mean, you might have one for one for uh, crystal and, and zero for amorphous or something like that. Um, so um, these materials are, again, they're, they're one of the, the key com competitors for so-called flash or non-volatile memory. This is the kind of computer memory uh, in which y if you take the battery away, it keeps the information. So you have a number in your cell phone. If the battery dies, you don't want to lose everything in your cell phone. Uh, and it needs to have low power consumption the standard technologies are, are sort of running out, so there's a, there's a desire to come up with something new and better. Um, so this, that's, that's what phase change memory is about. Students contribute very strongly to, to the, the, the knowledge base of the field. And one example is the silver alloyed uh, versions of the phase change memories. This is work that was carried out completely by Benet Prasai, one of my students. He implemented the, the computer codes, he did the simulations, he worked out clever ways to display the graphics. This paper explores the possibility of impurities, which to our knowledge no one has looked at before, uh, to, to this important phase change material, to, the, to this antimony, this germanium antimony tellurium material. Uh, and what it shows is that the addition of this impurity, and you see the silver is just fully bonded into the network in these sort of random places. The, 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 the really miraculous thing from my point of view, and I think from Binet's point of view as well, is that you see that when you crystallize this, this is something that we directly simulate. We go from this to this, and in the process you see that the, the silver happily joins the network just as if it was one of the other, the other atoms that were pre-existing there. 
that silver would fit into this cubic topology happily, I don't think anyone would have guessed. There were reasons why we looked at silver, and there were reasons why we chose the concentration that we did, what wasn't done by throwing darts at the periodic table. Uh, but the fact that one of the first things we tried already is producing something that looks like it might be better suggests that it would be warranted to have a more general systematic exploration. The potential applications of this, uh, of course, would be better memory devices uh, that, that might, might be switch even faster uh, and, and, and possibly even have higher stability. These devices, devices from this kind of material already exist. This is completely unexplored. This is the first time that, that this kind of impurity has been looked at. There are a lot of other things we need to do carefully and systematically, uh, and we might find dramatically better materials. There's a huge emphasis in the National Science Foundation, and actually in something that the President announced a few years ago, the Materials Genome Initiative. It's just exactly to try to try to produce systematic and efficient ways of predicting materials to help bring them to the market faster for American competitiveness, for example. This particular calculation is a, in some ways, it's, it's only the, the, the germ of a beginning, but it's a, but it's a real beginning, I think, toward this kind of goal.